In this video, I'm going to show how you can program Protel payphones for no charge calling. Eventually, my plan is to rack up a lot of this hardware aside from the payphone portions. But before I actually put all of this away and have it organized and tucked back, I've been playing with it all on this coffee table. So this makes it really easy to give a pretty good demo before I tear it all down and then rebuild it up somewhere else. So the heart of all of this gear is this Weiss Thin Client back there, that guy. So this is a Weiss V90LE. It has a 1.2 gigahertz VIA C7 processor that's actually adjustable between 400 megahertz and 1.2 gigahertz in 100 megahertz steps. It has one gigabyte of RAM, a 16 gigabyte SSD disk on module, and it dual boots Windows 98 SC and XP Pro. So one cool thing that I like about this thin client is that it has an actual serial port so I can interface it with old modems. Uh, this machine is what is going to be driving the software to program the payphones. So that software is built for DOS. Um, and aside from trying to get DOS set up, Windows 98 makes it really easy to run DOS software. So I went with this particular box because it has low power usage and it's reliable when compared to actual vintage machines. So it's a little efficient box. There's no moving parts whatsoever. It's newer than 30 year old machines. And while it's a lot of fun to tinker on that sort of genre of machine, they're just not reliable for running 24-7. I've had tons of weird stuff go wrong when I've tried to repurpose old hardware and keep it going. And it's, it's I guess, a lot like owning an old car, where it's, it's fun to work on things, but you wouldn't want it to be your daily driver. So that's, that's really why I settle for this thin client. Uh, a lot of people might ask why I'm not doing virtualization. So when I started this project, there was a lot of anecdotes about how virtualization didn't work. So some people would say, don't do VirtualBox, it runs on VMware, or don't do VMware, it runs on DOSBox, or it, it was a big circle of virtualization doesn't work. So my idea was to go with a base case setup for the programming. So I would use bare metal or as close to bare metal as possible. And once I was able to confirm that everything else worked in chorus, I could explore some virtualization options. So that's still something I'm considering looking into. Uh, while I was working on this, there's another payphone enthusiast by the name of Peter, who has done a lot of really good work documenting ProTel programming. And he was able to get some success running a VM of Windows 98 on VirtualBox, but he did a lot of testing and it just doesn't work as reliably as if you're running on actual hardware. So the, I'm sure there's still more testing to do with that. There's other types of virtualization software. There's a lot of variables, uh, but ultimately I would love to have some sort of lightweight VM, maybe running FreeDOS and the programming software that I can get distributed out and have good documentation and steps for somebody who wants to do this at home, but doesn't want to get older hardware or have to mess with the installation process or anything like that. So this thin client I actually got from eBay. You can get them for about $50 in sort of their base configuration. I actually paid closer to $100 for this one because the seller did all the work to upgrade the RAM, they upgraded the disk on module, they did the dual boot installation and tracked down and installed all the drivers. So even when you part it out for the thin client, the memory, the disk upgrade, it's well worth it to just get somebody to do the installation and driver hunting for you. Uh, I think it was only a delta of like $10 or something, so definitely worth it. So you can go that route, but you can also get these for about $50 or less. So next to the Weiss, this right here, so that's a Protel UPMS modem. 
So this modem is sort of unique or interesting in that it uses FSK modulation at 1200 baud instead of DPSK. That's a differential phase shift keying. Uh, it also seems to support 300 baud. I believe that's either Bell 103 or 103A, some sort of standard like that. And if you're wondering why the case is off, it's because I recently recapped it. So this modem actually had an interesting explosion, I guess you could call it, when I plugged it in for the first time. So it immediately made a popping noise that was probably actually the speaker on it, but it would pop and then it went off hook, which it's not supposed to do. It's supposed to wait for the computer to put it off hook. So I thought, okay, let me give it a recap. Uh, so I really just left it without the case as a literal smoke test. I wanted to make sure my recap worked and I didn't start a fire or anything. Though it still looks like this modem might be problematic. I don't think that the microphone is going to pick this up, but you can hear a busy signal coming from the speaker on the modem, which it's not supposed to do. So I might try to see what other components I can replace but ultimately I might just disconnect the speaker or put it on a switch or something because it's nice to have the speaker to listen to for troubleshooting, but you really don't need it. And the lights probably also help you just as much with the troubleshooting. So yeah, um, the reason that I got this Protel modem was because there was another anecdote that you needed to have this modem and this modem only when configuring a Protel 7000 payphone, which just so happened to be the only flavor of Protel payphone I had at the time. So since I've got this modem, I know that that's not the case. Peter, again, did some testing and he was able to get one modem working reliably, a 300 baud, and some other modems working sort of reliably, probably not too reliably, a 300 baud. So you can program these Protel 7000 phones at 300 baud, but there's just tiny differences probably in hardware implementation or timing or aging capacitors with modems that you might be unlucky depending on what modem you have lying around. So this modem, this Protel branded modem works pretty well. That might just be because it was engineered specifically to use with these phones. I'm sure the recap helped with it. But this is something I got just for this project, so I want to use it, I want to keep it alive, because it's a really interesting piece of history right here. So these modems are exceedingly rare and pricey. I think I paid about $90 for this one. So it definitely helped things along, but through Peter's testing, it might not strictly be needed. So if we move over to this other machine right here, so this is a Lenovo ThinkStation E32 small form factor. It's running a Xeon E3 1225V3 quad core 3.6 gigahertz processor, eight gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of SSD. And on that I'm running Debian 11. So this machine I actually bought specifically because of a T carrier PCIe card I had. So a couple years back, I knew I wanted to mess around with T-Carrier technology, but the cards on eBay were always really sporadically appearing, and some of them would go for insane amounts of money, while other ones would just sort of eek by unnoticed. So one day I put my foot down and I got a Sangoma T1 E1 card, and essentially I sat on that card for a while, and I bought this machine for the card. So the card was a half height card, so I got a half height machine to put the card in. Uh, if I could go back though, I would not get a Sangoma card, uh, which I'm going to talk about real soon here. Um, so as I mentioned, this is running Debian 11. I believe that's the long-term support version of Debian right now. I tried to do Debian 12, but when I installed Asterisk on this machine, so I'm running Asterisk version 21, um, I'm using it with Dottie, D-A-H-D-I, Dottie. So Dottie is what you are using essentially to interface with T-Carrier hardware from Asterisk. 
So with Sangoma cards, Sangoma cards needs another driver called Wanpipe. Now, Wanpipe is not very well maintained. It doesn't run on the latest versions of operating systems. It doesn't run on the latest kernels. It's supposed to support certain operating systems and you run it and it crashes and you have to open a ticket. The Sangoma stuff is pretty much a mess. Uh, if I could do this all over again, I would not have got, got a Sangoma card. I would have stuck to Digium cards. So Digium is who was um, heading up Asterisk before Sangoma took over. So Digium cards, they're not made anymore, but they're still out there. They still work. They're, from what I can tell, much, much better than the Sangoma stuff. So if I could do it again, I would go that route. And I would also probably get a full-size machine because now that I am keeping my eye out for T-Carrier cards, if you get a whole lot of them, especially ones that are full PCI heights, you're going to want a machine that's large enough to actually accommodate them. So this is good for maybe one or two half-height cards, but you could have a much bigger case and have a lot more cards in there and make it a much more worthwhile machine. So going back to what I was talking about with the Weiss in terms of power consumption, power consumption was also something I was considering for this machine since I'm also running this 24-7. So I looked up because um, I, I had the option to get either this machine or an identical one with an Intel i3 processor. And the power usage for the Xeon wasn't much more than the i3. So I believe that the, the Xeon would give me a lot more benefits overall, especially because I can use things like ECC memory in the future if I wanted to. So this machine, just getting that processor makes this a lot more versatile if I want to repurpose it for something later on. But it's, it's a pretty cool machine. I think I got this for about $30, $35 on eBay. And then it didn't come with a, a hard disk at all. So I got the cheapest name brand disk I could find. I think it was uh, a Kingston SSD or a Samsung. And I actually just double-sided and taped it into the bay because there was no caddy either. But machine works beautifully. I'm very happy with it. So the, the white boxy thing over here on the right, that's a CAC Addit 600 channel bank. They've had a couple of different brands or rebadges that I've seen. There's the Cactus Light, which is a much cooler name. I kind of wish I had a Cactus Light maybe one day. Um, I've seen Dell had their own version. So these are out there. Um, they're definitely in use or have been in use at a lot of different telco sites. Um, but they're really cool modular little units. So you can see that they can take um, a certain number of cards, which makes them really highly configurable. So mine has a TDM controller at the top to actually use with the T-carrier communication. And then the second card down is an FXS card. So that gives me eight FXS lines. So FXS lines, so that's subscriber lines. So I can essentially hook eight different phones or extensions up to this with this one card. There's, I could put more FXS cards in here. I could do FXO cards, so for office. So if I wanted to tie into an existing phone line coming into my house, I could use a card like that. Um, but they make a ton of different cards for this add-in, which is pretty great because you can really customize it to do a lot of different things. Uh, CAC also makes a lot of Unitasker devices. So you can get ones that are just FXS, uh, but they're usually about the same amount of money. And this machine, it, it's just really cool. It's cool that you can grow it and expand it as time goes on and just build upon it. So this I actually got from my buddy who is sort of a field deployed network engineer going around to various sites. So he got this one that was being decommissioned and sent it over to me. So I was really lucky to get this and I could just hook a T1 between this and the Think Station. And you actually configure this Addit with serial. So you do a lot of configuration on the Addit itself so it doesn't rely too much 
on uh, being configured by a machine that it's connected to. You set it all up, it's, it, it keeps everything in its own memory. So you might be wondering why I have this channel bank at all. And it's really because when I first started trying to program the payphone with the modem, I was running into issues doing this with ATAs. So ATAs would be the logical cheap choice to try because they're so inexpensive, but ATAs are notorious for having uh, issues with timings and latency, and it just wasn't working. The connection between them would always, always fail. So I knew I needed something a little bit more robust than ATAs, so I was talking with Interlinked, and he recommended a channel bank, and I just so happened to have this one. I had a card, I just had to put it all together. So Peter's testing that he was doing sort of at the same time he was he's using a line simulator, but he was able to make a dual FXS ATA work uh, by soldering some capacitors between the ports. And that seemed to help him immensely. So you can, of course, if you're in a lab environment at home, you can use a line simulator. You can probably use an analog PBX. You could use a two port ATA that you hacked. But I wanted something so that I could eventually make this publicly available, not just existing in a lab where it's just me. I wanted other people to be able to access it. So that's why I went with the channel bank. So the phone that I'm programming here that you can see on the table, this metal box, that's a Protel 7000 series, as I had mentioned before. So Protel is one of the big four for COCOTs. So COCOTs are customer-owned coin-operated telephones. So these are in contrast to payphones owned by the telephone company that had all of their call rating done in the central office. Um, in the 80s, with the Bell System divestiture, all of these COCOT companies started up allowing any old person to buy this sort of phone with a programmable board so that all of the call rating can be done on the board itself. So you can set all of your costs in this board. It doesn't need a central office. It's, it's all done locally, which is a pretty cool alternative to having everything through the phone company. So this board, as I mentioned, it's a 7000 series. And you can see I don't have it in its housing. I basically just have all of the the components you would normally have connected in the large payphone housing separately here. So we have the keypad with the hook switch. We have the battery. We have uh, the coin sensor over here, which you can kind of see. We have a big relay. Um, and of course we have the phone line that comes in here. And you're probably asking, what is going on with the screwdriver here? So normally when this is mounted, this keypad with hook switch is mounted vertically, you have a cradle at the top, sort of like a cup that the handset goes into, uh, and that pushes down the hook switch. So I'm basically just sort of pushing that down with the screwdriver so that the phone isn't always off hook. So that, that's just a little hack to, to keep that down. But anyway, this Protel 7000 board, that's normally in a GTE Quadrum style housing, so with a coin slot on the right. There's other Protel boards that would fit this housing. There's Protel boards that are meant for Western Electric housing, where the coin slot is on the left. I believe that's like the 8000 series. But this is a pretty typical board. Uh, we see a lot of Protels, at least here in the Northeast. But besides Protel, there's Elcotel, there's Intellicall, there's Ernest, there's a couple of payphone companies where the company may be long gone or sort of on life support, but their boards live on. So these, a lot of these are manufactured in the 90s and are sort of still kicking along, which is uh, really cool because they're still out there, they're still available. You can get parts for phones with these boards. It's sort of wild that they're still around. And uh, yeah, this one in particular is from 1996. So it's 
pretty old, but it's still going. So to, pay to program these payphones, we need a piece of software called ExpressNet. So ExpressNet, also called XNet, I might use that interchangeably. This is version 1.55. I believe it's the last version. It might not be, uh, but this is the last version that I've seen available. And this one is sort of infamous because they essentially released a free upgrade for ExpressNet for 1.55. And hackers essentially figured out that they could turn this upgrade into a full installer. So that's really how this is out there in the world. So this software is really what you need if you are a payphone service provider in the 1990s. So I, I guess we're sort of role playing as a PSP right now, but this will be what we can use so that the payphones can be programmed to actually rate calls for free at no cost to the user. We can use this to charge anything for the calls. This is the software that completely configures the phone as most of these Protel boards have no configuration on the board itself. Some of the older ones you can do rudimentary programming directly through the keypad, but a lot of them require this software to load options and everything to the phone. So let's get into how we actually wanna set up this software. So sort of working from the bottom up here, we go to system utilities menu, system parameters. So we can set the time zone. Uh, one thing that I like to do is disable password to enter program. So by default, when you load up the program for the first time, you need to enter username Protel password Protel X3 to get into the software. Uh, but because we're setting this machine up to run 24 seven, I'm trying to be mindful of things like unexpected reboots. So if I have this software launching automatically when the computer turns on, I wanna make sure it's logged in and ready to go. So turning off the password helps. It also just makes access easier. So back at the main menu here, let's go into the modems menu. We can do modem setup, COM2. So I've set a phone number for the modem. This is the FreakNet number. So if anybody is on FreakNet, they can access it through 263-0500. Uh, this is also available through the PSTN uh, for use by anybody out there who wants to connect over PSTN who might not be on FreakNet. But this is just what I have here labeled for the phone number for the modem. I don't actually think this is mandatory. So we have incoming enabled, outgoing enabled. I'm actually not making use of outgoing calls. So you can push software to the phones from the computer. You can also query the phones to get information about them, like how many calls they've had, how much money's in them, stuff like that really not of much use to me. And it's also more reliable for the phone to contact the computer than vice versa for programming. So I'm really just using the incoming calling, but there's no reason to not also enable outgoing. So all of these options, this is all just boilerplate uh, polling speed. So I have it set to 1200 because I have that Protel modem that supports 1200. You can also set it to 300. I've, I've noticed that this modem, it will occasionally fall back to 300 baud, but because I have the modem, setting it at 1200 is very safe. If, you're, if you have a 300 baud modem that you're working with, you'd wanna set this to 300. So you can also change the modem type here. So if you don't have that Protel, you can choose other, and it changes the init string. So if you do use another modem, you wanna add ampersand N1 to the end of this init string, that'll force 300 baud. So otherwise it might try to negotiate higher, but if you are using a generic modem, you want 300 baud. So let me just put this back, escape. And if we do a save, it'll actually reset the modem. Very cool, okay. 
So now we're going to keep working our way up. We're going to do edit options and registers. So if you're doing this for the first time, you basically want to come down here to default DDB1, which is just for a standard phone line. You don't want default coin for coin line. So you want B1 and then you want to clone it with F4. So I've already cloned it into this file options one, which we could take a look at. And there's not too much that I've modified here. Um, I've changed the number of rings to three instead of five so that if somebody's calling the phone, uh, like Interlink does testing with some of his scanning, it'll answer a little bit quicker. And then if I go down here, yeah, we want to set delay for central office dial tone to 1.5 seconds and central office dial tone timeout for eight seconds. Um, otherwise, it waits too long for the individual digits to be dialed and that can result in calls not completing. So there's a ton of other options in here. Um, one cool thing that I just like about this software in general is that the help is very good for the most part. So here we are, brand before after the bong tone. I don't know what that means, but if I hit F1 here, it gives me a lot of information here about the bong tone and, and what the potential options are. So it's good to just have that. You can really get yourself lost in a menu like this. Uh, one other thing I want to point out here is that there's this option for set modem speed at 1200 or 300 baud under miscellaneous options. So because I have that 1200 baud Protel modem, I'm setting as 1200. If you're recreating this at home, you probably want 300. So there's a lot of weird modes here that I'm not sure what they do. A lot more programming options and ends here with display messages, which I think that's for phones that actually have a display on them that can display text. But yeah, not too much to modify in that menu. Next we could go up here to call costing records menu. So similarly, I've cloned default B1 to cost one. So if we go in here, uh, what we really want to look at is the cost bands. So you have a lot of different bands here that you can use to customize different call types. Uh, so essentially, you want to set an initial rate. So this one, this band is band zero, so that's at 25 cents, an overtime rate, an initial amount of time, overtime. Uh, if you want to enable pocket dialer anti-fraud, how you want the keypad control to work after the call connects, your routing here. So you can have this set for inter or intra LADA. Intra basically means that the call is within your calling area. Inter LADA means it's outside. So that's essentially a long distance call. And then you can also map in different routes. So routing can get really tricky and complicated for special rules you want to apply to different types of calls. And there's a lot of customization you can do. Um, for the most part, I'm going to leave that as zero. And then card stuff over here, we're not doing any card transactions. We're not really charging for anything. So we're going to leave these as default. Um, but if I scroll down to band 64, so 64 is what is set in here by default. So I've gone ahead and modified this. So $0 initial rate, $0 overtime rate, uh, 2555, 255 for amount of time for initial time period of call. So this is unlimited time. And then overtime, I have it set to one. Essentially, I can set this to anything but zero will disable the call. So anything one or higher will work in combination with this 255 for unlimited call time. So I'm disabling pocket dialer anti-fraud. I don't know exactly what that means. It's probably something to do with red boxing, but I think it might be cool to play with that. So I'll leave that disabled. And then for keypad control after answer, I have that set to eight, which essentially just allows the maximum amount of keypad use. I think smaller or lower options, I should say, will only restrict to certain keys or number of characters, but this is the essentially unlimited option here. So we want to allow the user to interact however they're going to. And then we don't care about uh, inter or intralata. 
or routing because we're making the call free. So everything's gonna be free on this phone. And then, as I said earlier, we don't care about the card options here. So we'll just leave those alone. But if I scroll down here, so there's 79 different bands that you can modify. If you wanna have a lot of different customization for different types of calls, you have 79 bands to play around with. But if we keep going down, this keeps going, you can see we have our three digit codes here. So again, I've modified them to be free. 811, 911 incoming call, all set identically to be free. There's also speed dial numbers here. So those are set to be free as well, along with 555 numbers, 10 codes, 800 numbers, PBS, mix, MISC number. Basically I have everything set to free. So there's different country codes if you want to modify rates for different countries. Uh, same with cards. And then at the bottom there are star codes. Those are special codes you can use for different options within the ProTel phones themselves. So that's all set up. Um, and again, I'm using band 64 for free calls. So we go into edit NPA, NXX, and country code menu. So edit NXXs and a multi-band NPAs. This is essentially what we can use if we want to set up seven digit dialing. So you can specify an NPA as your home NPA essentially. So if I'm in Philadelphia, I could specify 215 and then any seven digit number I dial will go out as 215 followed by those seven digits. And then that allows me to actually rate differently for the NXX in that seven digit number. So it could be useful to somebody. Um, really though, single band NPAs is where we can see the mapping happen that kind of puts everything all together here. So as I mentioned, using that band 64, we have our NPAs here. So this is all of your area codes. So this is 200, this is 201, this is 210. You have this whole grid here where you can sort of specify everything out and have everything rated. You can go very, very customized with how all of these area codes are mapped here down to the digit. So a lot you can do. So back to the main menu, the last thing that we're gonna to touch on here is the site record. So here's the phone sites I have. So this is just what I've been using as a test phone. So it's 555-555-5555. Now if I go in here to edit it, you'll see I've put in just some basic description stuff. So it's a test pay phone. We've selected that cost one costing record and options one option record that I had gone through before. Um, you can also specify firmware that you want the phone to dial, but I'll just leave that empty. I don't think we really need to update any firmware. Different configuration here. So site location, if you wanna have good bookkeeping for where your phone is installed. The phone number, of course. Phone speed, I have it set to 1200. So if you're using a non-Proton modem, you probably want 300. The dial pattern and everything, this doesn't really matter too much. This is just for record keeping. A lot of description stuff there. So yeah, the big thing that you need to keep in mind is this phone number for your actual phone. So now that we have all of these records set up, we can actually go ahead and program our phone. So to sort of monitor things, we're gonna go into modem menu and then view modem status. And you can see our modem here. If we actually hit the space button, it gives us a little bit of a more detailed view. So working on the phone itself, essentially there's a program button, which you probably can't see here right next to the connector for the keypad. You have to hold this button down and then go off hook. So I need two hands for that, but I'm gonna turn on this little Radio Shack amplifier here. 
So you'll hear a little bit of a buzz, but this should let us sort of listen in to what's going on so you understand the audio cues that are going on while I'm doing this process. So if we hold down, we pull this out, and we wait for a beep. Okay, a very faint beep, that's all right. So we wanna dial zero, zero, and then our phone number of our phone. So five, 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 and with star, we'll hear a single beep. If we hear more than one beep, that means something went wrong and we need to try again. So next we're gonna set the number to call. So this is actually hooked through my ISP provided VoIP line. So it's VoIP over coax or something like that through the modem. So I'm gonna call out to the PSTN, which will connect up to uh, VoIP MS is where I have the number that's mapped to this modem on the PSTN. So we will dial 25 and then we'll dial the number of the modem. So that is 2252PROTEEL star. So that's 2252 Protel. Now we actually initiate the programming. So that is star pound three. And we'll hear it play back its phone number. So if you watch the channel back, you should see the light flicker. Yep, so we have the modem connection and it lets out a squeal. Now we have the connection being established, receiving phone status, sending security code, and then it should start programming. So it'll send blocks of programming down from the computer to the phone, um, usually between 10 or 15. So let's watch and see if it sends all the blocks. Okay, so the parameters have downloaded, resetting call accounting, phone clock reset, now it'll hang up, and it's done, and now it's waiting for another call to come in. Okay, so the phone has successfully downloaded all of the data, have the amplifier on, phone has just been programmed, so let's flash it once and if we do star pound six we should get the date and the time of the last software download I think it didn't pick up the star let me try that again There we go. So now that we have the phone programmed, let's try making a call 
to a number outside of my local area for free. So if we do yep, hook flash, so we'll do seven, one, nine, two, six, O, A, T, E, S. We did call and oats. Let's do two. So there you go. We've successfully programmed a Protel phone to allow completely free calls. So hang that up. So we have our phone programmed for free calls. And sort of the purpose of this project was having a community free programming line. So anybody can point their Protel phone at 2252 Protel and specify their phone number as all fives and get this programming whenever they want. Uh, we're considering expanding this so that people can send in their own options files, rate files, and then we can add somebody else's phone as another site record and have customizable or should I say specific configurations for people out there who want something different. So no longer do you have to get a setup like this, try to struggle with the software and hardware. You don't have to send your phone away to a company and pay them to program it. You don't have to pay somebody some sort of consulting fee to get it programmed. We want to make it easy. We want to make it free. We want to make it accessible. So that's really the next step. For right now, we'll have the line that'll program your phone for free use, but we're gonna build out from there and also try to make the documentation for this and the information for setting everything up yourself available as well. So we have definitive answers for how to get this working and we're gonna keep iterating on it. We're gonna see what we can virtualize. We're gonna see how to make it more robust. Uh, so that's it for now. Uh, hopefully there's some people with ProTel boards out there sitting, gathering dust that they wanted to get working but didn't know how, and they might find this solution viable for them and they can get their boards programmed for use. So that about does it. Happy payphoning, and I will see you next time.